Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill. Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we have a giant Blackhawks trade. We've got MLB draft and the All-Star break, and we've got a little Bears talk to do. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hog. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Sure, season's not going on right now, but that shouldn't stop you from heading on over to icehogs.com, getting yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, sign up for season tickets and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, we are at the All-Star break. The bleeding has stopped for the Chicago Cubs. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing just fine. Just, just fine. And how are you doing? I can't complain, um, you know, and I, and I instinctively wanted to start talking baseball first, but we've got a big, big story that's just breaking that uh, need to talk about. Yeah, I know where you're going with this, and I, I think you're right. I think we need to talk about it first. Uh, <clears throat> Duncan Keith is no longer a Blackhawk. Um, he was flipped to the Edmonton Oilers for a third round pick and Caleb Jones. And I, I guess my feelings on it is, you know, he, he requested the trade to be closer to his family. Um, it's at the end of his career anyway. You know, I still enjoyed him being out on the ice wasn't the same player, but I still enjoyed him being out on the ice. I enjoyed him being part of the team. I didn't enjoy still paying the five something million dollars a year cap hit, but I, I it's still, you know, we, we've talked about like Brent Seabrook. There's no three cups without Brent Seabrook. There's absolutely no three cups without Duncan Keith. Duncan Keith, if you want to name like the very top important players of the Blackhawks dynasty of the early mid 2010s, Duncan Keith is at least third. The only two that are probably above him are Taze and Kane. On the mat, it's Duncan Keith. You got a Norris Trophy winner. You got a Con Smythe winner. You had a guy who was leading ice time every night for over a decade. The guy was just a warrior. I mean, he was. He was a guy that can go out and you can just depend on him all the time. And, you know, even in his later years, like last year, was he great? No. Was he terrible? No. He wasn't as quick. He wasn't as athletic. That's just 10 trillion minutes catching up on you. But he was still a very smart player. And you got to appreciate that. And remember, Duncan Keith was here well before the Blackhawks even got good. He was drafted way back in 2002 in the second round, and he made his debut at the age of 21 in 05 06. So when he came up with the Blackhawks, nobody knew who he was because nobody really paid attention to hockey because old man Wirtz was still in charge. The fact that he was there for the whole transition, basically, from irrelevant to winning Stanley Cups, I that's... He's a really storied player for this franchise, and I believe he's second all-time most games played for the Blackhawks, I believe. Um, so, hats off to a great career, and what I think is really good to see is the fact that everyone understands. Everyone recognizes the fact that he has every right to request a trade to be closer to his family. 
He's got nothing left to prove here. He's at this, the end of his career. And, hey, the salary was eaten. So that's more money off the books. Yeah. I, I You know, the fact is, um, over the last several days, maybe a week, I've here, been hearing rumblings that pretty much the only team that was was willing to deal to get uh, Duncan Keith was the Edmonton Oilers who are tired of getting bounced in the first round. Um, and, you know, at, I think it was in the athletic. It, it was, it was an actual like legitimate uh, outlet that basically said Edmonton has every bit of leverage in this, these negotiations and they're like, they should essentially get him for nothing other than a salary dump where they only retain half the salary. So basically Blackhawks pay half the salary and give them Duncan Keith for nothing in return or a late pick. Um, and most Edmonton fans seem to agree with that to some varying degree that there was but essentially the same premise, Edmonton had all of the leverage. The Blackhawks had no leverage. Right. And Stan walked out of this not retaining any salary, dumping the entire Keith contract, getting a third-round pick, and getting a 24-year-old defenseman out of it. And not only a 24-year-old defenseman, the younger brother of Seth Jones, who has been rumored to be a target for the Blackhawks this offseason. So are they going to try the uh, White Sox strategy of bringing in family members to try to lure a big free agent or trade? I can't remember if Seth Jones is a free agent or they would need to trade him, but Seth what Jones I'm... has one year left on his contract. So, so they would it would have to be trade a trade. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I thought. But um, you know, may not be nothing that they got Caleb Jones back or it could end up being nothing. But all I know is that the Blackhawks did express some interest in bringing in a guy like Seth Jones here. And look, if they want to do something big this off season, then that might be one of the routes to go. You have cap space now. Uh, it's a matter of what you want to trade within your organization. If you want to try to make something work, but honestly, I'm, I couldn't believe the return. I said, wow, all the salary was eaten and you got a player back and you got a draft pick back. Not that the draft pick is anything huge, but still, I mean, when I, when they were trading Duncan Keith, the only thing I was thinking of is man, it's, it's just, you know, you're going to get some cap relief in return and that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I was never expecting anything of substance in return, but they got more in return than I figured. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, this is like the third trade ever that Stan has won. <laughs> and I feel I'm here for it. Yeah. It, yeah, no kidding. It feels good to be uh, the winner of a trade. And so this, now that Dunk This is oh, absolutely sorry, yeah, this is absolutely a win for the the Blackhawks because you know it, all sentiment aside is we we all love Duncan Keith and and if there's any Blackhawks fan that slanders Duncan Keith, he doesn't deserve he or she doesn't deserve to be a fan of the Blackhawks. Um, you, your front lawn will be visited by Sean Hopman on stilts. Let's just say that. After Taco Bell. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, uh, God. That's a way to start our show. <laughs> oh, God. But, I mean, it's just where the Blackhawks are right now, it, Duncan Keith doesn't do anything to help us. Um. You know, uh, this is a this is a team that's pretty much rebuilding, and there's no need for a 38 year old defenseman. So, uh, it was it was a right time. I mean, I'm glad that Duncan Keith requested this trade rather than, um, you know, the Blackhawks try to buy him out or, you know, s sell him to Seattle or something along those lines. Um, it's kind of worked out good for everybody. I mean, when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, now I'm hoping that, uh, he does well with Edmonton and mm -hmm. the Blackhawks have five plus million dollars extra to spend this off season. 
And, you know, we'll see what we have with Caleb Jones from what I'm reading. Um, it, it's funny. I, some stats people are saying that at this juncture, he's, he's statistically a better defenseman than Duncan Keith. But most people are saying that he is, he's like a, um, a third pairing defenseman in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, if he's technically better than Duncan Keith, that's just purely because Duncan Keith is old. I mean, in his prime, I think Duncan Keith would be a lot better, <laughs> you know, but oh, Duncan you know, Keith it, is better than most defensemen at, in his heyday. So, well, exactly, exactly. I mean, you remember how good he was when he was winning Norris trophies and going to all-star games, you know, he could score. He was just a really good presence on the ice. And you know what's crazy now? With Duncan Keith gone, we said goodbye to Brent Seabrook officially earlier in the year. So Kane and Taze are the only cup-winning players left on the Blackhawks. Yeah. Isn't that nuts to think about? That's that's crazy. Um, yeah, because Shaw, Shaw's gone now and Seabrook and Wow. Crawford's gone. Hosa's retired. Uh, Jomerson is probably going to retire soon. He's been, obviously, in um, Arizona for the past few years. Brandon Saad is gone. Yeah, Brian Bickle's gone. Obviously, guys from the 2010 team, like Sopel, are long gone. John Madden, Troy Brower, uh, Patrick Sharp, even though he's, you know, doing broadcasting with, you know, he's not on the team or playing, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what we got. But before we, we guarantee this is Brandon Saad is a free agent right now. Yeah, that's true. Could he come back a third time? <laughs> uh, but he, that would be, that would be a stand move right there. He's like, well, we've got all this salary cap. We need to bring back Brandon Saad. You know, I like Brandon Saad, and if you brought him back on a good deal, I wouldn't mind it as much, but I could totally see them just overpaying him. Brandon Saad is going to get paid. Yeah. He's going to so get that's some why big I don't, money. That, which is why I don't think that, I, as much as I like Brandon Saad, it's probably best not to go that route, because you're probably not going to get him at a really ideal price. Yeah. So um, now it's going to be interesting because Duncan Keith was one of the players that you had to protect for the expansion draft because he had a no movement clause. Um, now you open up another defenseman spot to protect a player. So so the Blackhawks are going to, it's going to be interesting to see who they decide to protect. Um, do they protect Caleb Jones, who they just traded for? And I'm I'm glad you did bring up that this is Seth Jones's brother, and the Blackhawks mm -hmm. have long been uh, linked to Seth Jones as somebody that they really would like to um, bring to the Blackhawks. So you know, if nothing else, it's a it is you're right. It is the White Sox strategy of like let's entice them by signing their their lesser siblings and cousins. But, you know, put a few to put a few things in perspective. You look at a guy like Seth Jones. You know, he's a defenseman. Um, he's been with the Columbus Blue Jackets for the past like four or five years now. I mean, the dude's a pretty good hockey player. He's you know been an All Star. He's been a Norris finalist, and he's not old. He's only twenty six right now. So if you're looking for a proven defenseman. You know, Seth Jones could be a nice anchor going forward. So, you know what I didn't know is that mm -hmm. um, Seth and Caleb Jones, their their dad is Popeye Jones, who played for a long time in the NBA. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I didn't know that until recently. I didn't know that until like two hours ago. <laughs> I had That's no idea. Awesome, that, though. Yeah, so it's it's funny though. Like, um, you just don't expect like an NBA player's kid to, or multiple of their kids to to go on to play hockey. So, uh, you know, that's that's interesting. Um, but 
you know, definitely inherited the athletic ability. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think Popeye Jones still coaches. I think he's one of the assistants for maybe the 76ers or the Nets. Yeah, I don't know what Popeye is up to these days. Old Popeye. Old Popeye Jones. Yeah, he played for the Mavericks, the Raptors, the Celtics, the Nuggets, the Wizards, the Warriors. And he is an assistant coach for the 76ers. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's funny. Yeah. It's, I wonder just where the, the hockey came in. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I'm looking to see here. Uh, so it says during Jones tenure with the Denver Nuggets, he approached Joe Sackick of the Avalanche about his sons playing ice hockey. Um, he advised the uh, Popeye Jones to enroll his sons in skating classes first. Hmm. Okay. A few years later, Seth played for the United States under 20 national team, which won gold. And Caleb was a member of the, under 20 team four years later that won gold so there you go yeah there you go but yeah it's uh it's, it's it, it it does open up things for the blackhawks as far as salary goes it's going to be interesting to see how they decide to protect who they decide to protect um you know caleb is a more of a defensive defenseman so maybe they they look at it as if he plays well does that give us leverage about signing a big old Opie? Yeah. Is Zadorov, I, I don't know what their infatuation with him is and why he thinks he deserves $5 million a year, but yeah. Um, yeah. But I, at least gives them leverage that they don't need him. So hopefully they can get him down to a, a better number two and a half <laughs> seriously i just I, I don't get it but sans could be like oh we got the money now let's give it all to my little boy's adore of if he does that he will ruin all of the good graces that he has with the city for the duncan keith trade yeah well We'll see what happens. He's like, I can't have these good feelings for more than an hour. <laughs> Let me screw it up. Let's give all the cat this a door off. <laughs> it's like, we had no problem scoring points, but we had trouble with goaltending and, and blue line. He's like, let's go out and get another forward. <laughs> <laughs> and spend all our cap. That's the ticket. Uh... All right, should we talk a little baseball here? Yeah, I got the home run derby on in the background. It just oh, started. Yeah, let me let me turn that on. Yeah, uh, Trey Mancini's up. He's got eight home runs. Ooh, make that nine. What station is this on? ESPN. Yeah, make that nine. So what? It's been, what, six years since they started the new format with the clock? Because I think when they started it, that was in 15 when both Rizzo and Bryant were in the home run derby. Yeah, it's been it's been a minute. That was in Cincinnati. Because, you know, I just grew up with the classic. You have certain amount of outs, and then when you're on the last out, you have the golden ball. It's changed so much, the, the, the format for the home run derby. Um you know, I, to me, I don't care. It just, it's fun to just watch guys mash the ball. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I just find it interesting how, like, you know, you can win or lose a home run derby now with the time based on just how good the other pitcher is. Because if he's not giving you pitches, there's not much you can do about it. At least... In the old format, if the pitches weren't looking good, you didn't have to swing at them, and there was no penalty if you didn't swing at them. Where now, you're kind of forced to swing at everything because you're at a time limit. But don't you get to pick oh, your pitcher? 
you do, but y- you know, y- you never know how how good that pitcher is gonna do. You know, they they might be nervous, they might not be throwing you exactly what you like. You go out there and you fire your pitcher. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you fire your hand picked pitcher. Wow, Trey Mancini, he was off to an incredibly slow start. He takes a timeout and now he hits 19. That's impressive. I am just so excited to watch Shohei Otani in this. Yeah, watch. He's going to hit like three. Yeah, I know. I know. But, I mean, have you seen some of those home runs that Otani's hit? Dude, he's he's like a monster. So, he I like, is he the first pitcher or first player to ever start a game as a pitcher and compete in the home run derby? Yeah. Yeah. He's the first player ever to be elected as an all-star as both a hitter and a pitcher. Yeah. He's he's doing stuff that hasn't been done since Ruth. Like literally not since Babe Ruth. What is he at the All-Star break? What does he have like 34 home runs? 33. 33. Okay, so he's got a lot of home runs at the All-Star break. And I think they were saying the only other person to have to like reach that mark um by the All-Star break and international player was Sammy. Huh. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Because, you know, Bonds and McGuire are both American. And, um, you know, you look at some of the other sluggers. Whereas, you know, Tani, you know, he's from overseas. and Well, he's not allowed to be the uh, face of the uh, of Major League Baseball, I learned, from uh, Stephen A. Smith. Yeah, what a ridiculous take. Honestly, he, everyone should embrace what Shohei Otani is doing because nobody alive has seen it. I mean... Anyone who watched Babe Ruth in his early days with the New York or with the uh, Boston Red Sox when he was pitching and hitting is dead. Everyone who saw it's dead. So nobody alive has seen this. And not only do we have a chance to witness this happen, we're witnessing it in modern times where sports is accessible at the palm of your hand. You know, back when Babe Ruth was doing it, there was no TV, there were no smartphones, there was no internet. You just watch the newsreels or read the papers. You saw or the you talkies. Had, you had the game to see it. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. So we're seeing that something that's we have not witnessed before. So it should be embraced as much as possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. I, the only thing I don't like is that he plays, he plays on the West Coast and... The games mostly are too late for me to watch. Yeah, and you know what else is a shame? You have a organization with both Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, and yet they, they, they never win. They're mediocre at best every year. Yeah, no matter who they bring in, it just it doesn't work out. I just I feel like they never focus on what they need. Or they just say, you know, we're going to throw a bunch of money at free agents and then not worry about actually developing talent around them. When's the last time the Angels had a legit good pitching staff? 2002? Yeah, like, honestly, it's been a while. It's been, a, it's been, a, it's been more than a minute. <laughs> and Shohei Otani and Mike Trout can't be the entire team. You got to build stuff around them. You need to give them a good rotation. You need to give them a good bullpen. And you need to give them good depth. They have gone out and gotten so many players over the past decade. They brought in C.J. Wilson. They brought in Josh Hamilton. They brought in Albert Pujols. They were able to sign Shoy Otani. The one guy they did develop that turned out pretty damn good recently, Mike Trout, arguably the best player we've ever seen. And yet, they can't build a good enough team to compete for a World Series. It's, it's a shame because I think a majority of the baseball world would absolutely love to see Shohei Otani pitch in the World Series and then hit in the World Series as well as watch Mike Trout play in the World Series. I would love to see Mike Trout play in a World Series. But who knows if we're even going to get that or when we're going to get that. I don't think we will, to be honest with you, unless he goes somewhere else. And, and I that's not happening. And I don't see him. I see him playing for one organization his entire career. It would just suck to be like Ernie Banks. You know, he played his entire Hall of Fame career with the Cubs. He never saw a postseason game. Now, obviously, it was a little different back then. But still, 
He never saw a postseason game. Mike Trout's only seen like one series worth of postseason games. He's never been on a team that's won a postseason series. I think he's only been to the postseason once, maybe twice. But it's not it's not like he's making it every year and they're losing the first round. Heck, it's not even like a lot of the seasons are like borderline contending. A lot of the seasons, the team's been blah. Um, who's the new guy that has the, like the even uh, the like the six o'clock show on ESPN one thousand? I honestly don't know. Can't think. He played for Major League Baseball. Um, I just remember he he's predicting that Trevor Story wins the home run derby. On the the hometown crowd. Yeah, he he factor. he put it. No, he put it with the uh, the the used to playing in the uh, the mile high atmosphere well yeah i mean that's not which, getting tired I, I, which is valid i mean it's valid, that valid except that he has joey gallo in the first round so i don't think joey gallo is going to get you know gassed in the first round yeah i mean I, it'll be interesting to see yeah well you know the other interesting thing too about this derby is you know you're obviously playing at a much higher altitude so obviously Obviously, naturally, people are excited because you're like, okay, you know, high altitude, the ball is going to travel. We've seen Coors Field. Um, There are some guys that have played very few or maybe no games here at Coors Field. You know, especially the American League guys that haven't played in the National League. Yeah. So how they handle it versus others. That's true. Um, You know, I, I love the home run derby. I, it's it's of of all of the pre All Star game activities in any sport, it's the best in my opinion. Oh, hands down, hands down. I know we like the dunk contest; that's fun. I know we like some of the hockey games, the shootouts. I know we like some of the Pro Bowl stuff, like the like the catch and throw drills or whatever. But the home run derby, I just I don't think you could beat the home run derby. It's it's intense. It's fun. You see balls hit that aren't, you know, normally hit in regular games, and the crowd goes wild. It's just great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a hot take right here. Oh boy. I don't really like the dunk contest. I loved it as a kid, but honestly, you know, nobody's really doing anything so cool that I, I am like, I already saw that. You're not really doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I actually kind of agree with you. And it's not that I'm like, oh, it's bad. It's just that it's, I don't know, it just seems repetitive at this point. Yeah, I mean, the home run derby and some of the skills competition for hockey are the ones that I will go out of my way to watch. Like tonight, I said, I'm not missing the home run derby. I'm going to make sure I have it on while we're doing the show. You know, when I was a kid, I used to have my friends over for like baseball all-star weekend. I would have like parties and have people over. We'd, you know, grill out. We'd grill hot dogs, hamburgers. I used to turn All Star Week into like an event, and I kind of miss doing it. But that's how much I enjoy the All Star festivities for baseball. I mean, you have the home run derby first. Second, the baseball All Star game is an actual baseball game. It's not like that with the other sports. I mean, this is you are actually playing a baseball game. At a pretty much normal level, whether it counted or not, you know, you have your pitcher. Yeah, you switch the pitcher every inning or two, but still, you know, he's throwing hard. He's throwing his stuff, and they're they're out there swinging and playing like it's a normal baseball game. Well, didn't Pete Rose ruin somebody's career sliding into third? Ray Fossey. <laughs> yeah. Ray Fossey. And I believe Leo DeRocher, when he was the Cub manager, he was the uh, third base coach at the All-Star game. Also, did you see the all-star uniforms? I didn't. Oh, my God. You will want to vomit your guts out. And I thought I read somewhere that they wanted to wear them to wear those during the game. And you know what I always say is one of the cool things and unique things about the baseball all-star game is the fact that everyone wears their own uniform. And I think it was, like, when I was a kid, I thought it was the coolest thing how, like, 
look at that. You know, the, the Reds and the Cubs and the Cardinals and the Pirates are all teaming together as one super team. Like, yeah, that's your guy in their team uniform, and they're uniting together to play on a team. I know that sounds really cliche and kind of goofy, but I thought that was half the charm of it. I'm I'm going to go out on a, and say that these All-Star Game uniforms, I'm looking at them, they look like... Oh man, that guy just took a tumble. <clears throat> uh, they look like MLS uniforms. I just they, like, they look dude. they look like uh, like women's pro soccer uniforms. Like I, I that's not that's not baseball all star uniforms. Sorry. No. Wow, Trey Mancini, lower seat upset. Wins 24-23 at the buzzer. Because it uh, looks like uh, Olsen just pulled it foul. So that clinched the win for Mancini. Good first round. Yeah, no, that was good for two guys that are I, I didn't expect a lot from. And you, no, and, I know. And you had a dude take a tumble. And you had a dude take a tumble. Well, good for Trey Mancini. Because if you remember, last year he had cancer. Yeah, yeah. he gets, uh, I, I'm rooting for him. You know, I, I got a soft spot for the Orioles. And... Um, you know, soft spot for people with a, a good story like that. So he's, he's the guy I'm rooting for. And I don't think, I mean, there's, there's probably about a snowball's chance in hell. He wins it all, but I'm rooting for him. If he goes on a nice, if he at least goes on a nice run here, that would be really amazing. Yeah. But, um, let's, let's start here with the white Sox. Um, okay. You know, we got we got a few things going on here. Is we got a team that's coasting in their in their division. I mean, they're yeah, they're <laughs> they've won this division already. Let's be real. Yeah, the the only thing now is can can they play well enough to to get home field advantage in in the playoffs? Well, and I think they're gonna go for it. I don't think they're gonna take their foot off the gas. They're not gonna try. And you know, say what you want about Tony Larusa, but I don't think he's gonna accept taking the foot off the gas. I think he's going to try to keep them motivated, keep playing. And especially if you bring in some reinforcements, if you make a trade or two, if you end up bringing in, you know, let's say an Eduardo Escobar, or, you, you know, you bring in some veteran depth to help you along the way, you know, they're not going to take their foot off the gas. I, I can guarantee that. I think they're, they're determined enough to keep that going. I, the thing is though, is, uh, Will will they actually go out and make a trade? I mean, I feel like even if they're coasting, they have to for the sake of the playoffs because that's a whole different beast. You have to have reliable depth there. I know Eloy Jimenez has begun his rehab, so you expect to get him back. Um, you know, Yasmani Grandal is going to miss some time. Uh, you're still working on getting Robert back. So th there are guys to bring back. And, you know, you hope you have some of them for the postseason. You should have most of them outside of Nick Madrigal. But uh, I still think it'd be wise to go out and get somebody or two. Even if you're going to win the division hands down, you got to think about what's beyond that. But but here's the thing is academically, everybody knows that the White Sox need to be buyers and they need to improve. But we all knew that going into the season that they've got a great lineup. They need to add depth slash bulletproof this lineup for just mm -hmm. a situation like this. And they didn't do it. So, you know, with how cheap this organization is, is there a possibility that they look at Eloy Jimenez and Luis Robert coming back as their their reinforcements and don't don't bolster this i uh, i don't see them doing nothing i think they're gonna get somebody even if it's not necessarily a huge name i mean eduardo escobar he's a guy that isn't a huge name but can contribute and i don't think he's gonna cost all that much at least i don't think but i i don't know i i think they're gonna go out and get somebody even if it's not that big they're not just gonna stand pat there's no way. I mean, what does es Eduardo Escobar bring to this team? A little more pop. 
little bit. I mean, he's got a 780 OPS, which is okay. Um, I, I don't know. He's like a 250 hitter. I don't know. I, I just, I don't think he's, he's anything that special. Um, I, I wish they would actually, actually try to bring in somebody that can make a difference. Like Trevor Story, the guy batting right now. Like Trevor Story. Um, or, I mean, there's two guys on the Cubs I think would really fit well. Uh, you know, is, we'll deal with this later, but I'm just saying is if you could pry Chris Bryant away, move you on Moncada to second, and that adds some big pop to your bat. Um, if you bring in a Javi Baez, he could go over there and play superstar level second base and bring some pop to your lineup. Um, but those are, um, you know, that's, they, they actually have to pony up to do that. And I, I just don't know if they will. Yeah, I don't see, I, I don't necessarily see them making a blockbuster. I really don't, but I think they're going to get something, maybe a few things, a few decently sized things, nothing too crazy, but, uh, I think they're going to do something. They they can't just stand Pat. Is a is is standing Pat good enough to win your division by like 15 plus games? At this point it probably is, but again, you got to think of the big picture and beyond. Because, you know, we've seen them get by a number of teams in the regular season just fine, but we've also seen the challenges of playing some of the teams that they're going to have to get through if they want to win the World Series this year, like Houston and Boston, you you know, you're, you're going to just want to have to stock up a little more on talent. Yeah, I, I just think this team, if you look going forward, is Rodon's probably going to be gone after this year. Lance Lynn probably gone after this year. You don't think they're going to try to extend him? I don't think that they will pay the money that the market will give him. Either one. I mean, I can agree with... Rodon because Scott Boris is his agent and he's going to try to get him absolutely paid. So I agree with that with Lance Lynn. I'm not sure I'm going to completely rule out them extending him or giving him a new offer. I'm not saying they will, but I'm not going to rule it out. All right. Walk me through what you think Lance Lynn is worth on the open market. And Walk me through what the biggest contracts in White Sox history are. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think Lance Lynn would be seeking at least a three-year deal. Now, I get that there is risk that he because he is older. I think he's like, what, 33, 34 right now? Am I correct? What was that? Sorry, I accidentally, I accidentally unplugged my headphones. Oops, nice going. <laughs> I know. Clap, clap, clap. Um, I was just saying, Lance Lynn's like, what, 34 right now? 33, 34? Somewhere right around there. So, you know, I, I think teams would be willing to give him three years-ish around there. Uh, average salary is obviously going to be well over $10 million a year, I would imagine. I would imagine so, much more than that. Yeah, obviously. Um, I think we're looking close to around the 20s in average salary at least the next two years. But that's what he's going to be seeking. Uh, so he's not going to come at a premium price, that's for sure, especially the way he's pitching now. Um, I also believe that most teams are going to say, you know, I don't really want to give you over three or four years because you are older. I think three years is a very reasonable number of years for a guy like him. Let's say you get two out of those three years being really good. Then that contract is probably worth it. But do the White Sox pony up? I just, that's, that's, you know, a lot of money for this organization. They don't like to pay. And but they're going to I I feel like they're going to they're going to have to pay some money this coming off season if they want to stay in this. I get it. They've developed a lot of talent. They've built a core that can win multiple championships over the next few years, but you're still going to need to fill those holes somehow. 
unless they go just another route, they sign, you know, or bring in somebody younger, whether it's a trade, whether it's a signing, I don't know. But Lance Lynn seems to fit in pretty well here. And, you know, especially with Tony La Russa being around, does that kind of entice him to want to stay even more? Um, let's see. I'm looking at the White Sox 40-man roster. Um, so they'll have Dylan Cease as a starter. Mm-hmm. They might try to tell us that Garrett Crochet is going to be a starter. They'll have Lucas Giolito. They'll have Dallas Keuchel. They'll have Michael Kopech. Keuchel's one more year, correct, after this? I believe so. Um, so you're looking at them either having five-man roster or rotation or needing to add one pitcher. And... Uh, I don't know if the White Sox will pony up. I just really don't. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, if, if you're making an argument of them saying they might just say, you know what, we're going to try to do everything in our power to build our starting rotation from within, I could see that. I could see them saying, all right, you know what, Crochet is going to be a starter, and then we're going to try to make Michael Kopech a starter. And then, boom, you have him with Giolito, Keuchel, and Cease. I, I, I could see that. I could. I mean, I think I think you're that's probably what you're looking at. Um and I think they'll throw an offer to somebody, either uh Rodan or Lance Lynn, but I, I just don't see it as an offer that that they want. Yeah, you know, like I said earlier, I think the trickiest thing with a guy like Lance Lynn is the fact that he is older and we do know just from seeing it where you see veteran arms, they're going strong. And then all of a sudden they could just drop like a rock, not saying that's going to happen this year or even next year, but there is always risk involved in that. I, I mean, absolutely. I, we're seeing Jake Arietta on the North side just deteriorate every day. I mean, he's deteriorated to the fact that he might be one of the worst pitchers in baseball. I mean, if the Cubs had anybody else to f put in that spot, I think they would. I think they would DFA him. Oh yeah, of course. Um, you know, and it's expensive uh, DFA because you got He's got an option for next year too. Right, right, and you know, going forward with the Sox, you know. You wondered if when they got Lance Lynn, if they said, you know what, we're going to just make sure this is a one-year thing and we're going to do everything we can to take advantage of this one-year window we have, Lance Lynn, or they brought him in thinking, hey, if you do well, maybe we'll keep you around a little longer. I don't really know. So we're going to find that out soon enough, I guess. They can say, I mean, I don't know if they can honestly say that they – They'll bring him in and do everything in their power to win the one year because they didn't. In the offseason, we all said, oh, hey, here's some spots that they could really use some depth. And the White Sox were like, nah, we're good, dog. And and now it's biting them absolutely in the ass. You know, they're still a very good team. Just imagine if, you know, the the absolute catastrophic injuries they've had if they had depth, better depth, or they just didn't have those, uh, you know, holes in the, in the lineup, you had some better depth. You know, look at the guys oh, that they've would, played in the outfield. They'd be up 25 games probably. Okay, that's a little extreme, but they'd be up a lot more. I mean, again, it does, the, the division race doesn't matter. The division race is over. It is, it's been over since the beginning. But, um, yeah, you know, you just you, you hope that you can at least get most of your core back in healthy before the postseason because you can't get away with putting Jake Lamb and Goodwin out there come October. Well, I mean, just looking at their injury report right now. Well, I mean, this is not injury, but Adam Adam Eaton DFA'd. They sent him packing. Aaron Baum, which is good because he was garbage. He was hot garbage. Um, Aaron Bummer's on the ten day with a hamstring. 
Yasmani Grandal had a knee, knee surgery. He's out probably six weeks. Um, you've got uh, Evan Marshall, TBD with a forearm. Jake Lamb, TBD with a quad injury. Eloy Jimenez with the pec injury. He is probably in early August will be back. Um, Luis Robert, TBD with that hip, hip flexor, but it's looking like probably August-ish for him too. Um, Nick Madrigal out for the rest of the season. And you have a ton of injuries, like key injuries to your team. It's a lot of injuries, yeah. It is a lot of injuries. I mean, when you lose, when you lose three starters, three key starters, um, that's just that's just tough. It's absolutely tough. And they need, you know, they need they need to put guys in there. Is sure we know that Yasmani Grandal is is coming back, but here's the thing. A lot can happen in those six weeks and you don't have, have a good backup catcher is I think, I think Chirinos like the Cubs have will be a good fit. That's the kind of guy you, you would want. So they could hold down the fort for you for, for a few weeks. Um, and, but be able to step back when Grandal comes back, you still got a while left before, before Robert and Jimenez come back, you could still use depth at those positions because are the even when they come back, are those guys going to be playing every day? Or are you going to take it easy on them because they're right? You know they they're going to have to work their way back. Well, you know it's when you mention that and you just you know you bring up the idea of uh, crosstown trades. I know he might not be the most exciting to White Sox fans, and I know it might not be the best option, but if you want a platoon power bat, Jock Peterson is probably going to be traded, so do you get a guy like him to at least be a platoon outfielder with some pop? You know, it, it's not going to cost you anything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's a guy that they was on their radar that they wanted prior to him going to the Cubs. It just They've wanted him for several years now. They It just when they the White Sox went to him. He had, he didn't realize what the market was going to look like for him. Right. Um, and, and Jock has a, an option for next year too. So this could just not, it, you know, it's not necessarily a rental. It's, it's a reasonably priced, um, you know, depth position piece. Right. Or, and someone who's versatile or too. once Robert and Eloy come back, is, you know, uh, he, he, he could be at that, you know, the, a platoon out there in that outfield. You could move Aloy to, you know, playing more DH and, and Peterson out there. So, you know, it, it gives you flexibility for not a ton of money. Yeah. Now... Can we just talk about the fact that they DFA'd Adam Eaton and thank goodness they did? Well, he's a turd person and he was batting one, what's 173? Yeah, I mean, he, as my one friend who's a White Sox fan put it, uh, he was uh, brought in to be, a, <laughs> as he put it, a La Russa stooge. He was, and then he just became a stooge. Yeah, I mean... Didn't the White Sox get rid of him in the first place because he was kind of a pud? That's yeah. He's a turd, Ferguson, and uh, they got rid of him, and then they bring him back because they were desperate, and and he's still a turd, Ferguson, and he's not even playing well. So, um, good DFA'd, and um, you know, probably won't see too much of him in the future. No. No. I mean, you know, the first go around, as much of a putt as he was, at least when he was with the White Sox the first time, he was a solid player. And he got you some really nice pieces in return, including Lucas Giolito in the trade. It just, it, it never made sense to me why they'd bring him back. But, you know, whatever. Um, 
And it's just sort of made me think because I was like, he, here's where my brain went. It's like Adam Eaton, DFA'd, probably won't ever get a, a major league shot again. He'll probably get a, a minor league invite. And uh, and then that got to me thinking, I was like, wonder what Addison Russell's up to right now. I know he was in some, like, Mexican league, and... He played last year he... in a Korean league, and now he's in a Mexican league. Right, right. Wow, so Trevor Story just beat Gallo by one, 20 to 19. Well, there we go. That's... Joey Gallo really started off slow in that round. Yeah, he was starting to pick it up, but it was a little too, little too late. I mean, he was crushing it in the extra, the bonus time. If he, yeah. if he hit like that throughout... Uh, he would have won that easily. He would, yeah, he would have hands down won that. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I mean, he's been just playing international ball. I mean, ever since the Cubs got rid of him, he hasn't even had any major league affiliated stints, minor league or major. No, he's toxic. And I, I don't see him playing in the bigs ever again, frankly. No, he's he's done. He is done. Dunzo. And he was once called the next Barry Larkin. Yep. And that is that is not the case. Nope. Um let's see. Looking at come on, load here. I'm just curious of what his stats look like in the Mexican League. Uh, 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 da, 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 da. Do you remember which Mexican league it was? I just knew it was. Uh, I knew it was. I think it's the Mexican Independent League. Yeah. So um, I, I I know a few teams from that league. I just don't know. He plays for Aceros Aceros de Monclova in okay, the Norte Division. And let's see. Oops. He is third in the team in home runs. First in RBIs. Um, he is batting 304, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth. Eighth on the team. Third on the team is Dwight Smith Jr. No kidding. Son of former Cub great Dwight Smith. Yeah. Let's see. What's OPS? Addison Russell has an 870 OPS, while Dwight Smith Jr. has over 1,000 OPS. And he still has an infinity turd factor. Yeah, so... He's not he's not even that good on a team in the Mexican League. So, yeah, Barry Larkin, he is not. No, not Barry Larkin. Um, let's see. What else with the White Sox? Yeah, I, I I don't see them making big splash honestly with the trades. They maybe they bring in a guy of Escobar's caliber. I don't think they just bring in any anything big. I honestly think that they're going to say uh well, the guys that we have coming back healthy are going to be our our improvements. Um, but the uh, but they did have the Major League Baseball draft this past weekend, and I, I'm still on a pain site right now. So... Oh, sorry about that. Um, sorry about oh, that. Oh, no problem. Please ignore that. My that was my phone. Uh, they they did have draft and they first round pick they uh, they picked back to back Cubs and White Sox twenty and twenty one, and the guy that they have been tied to and linked to for for a while now, um, is Colson Montgomery, a shortstop out of Indiana of Indiana High School, is the guy that they did pick. Um, gets a lot of comparisons to Corey Seager. Uh, which would be huge for them, but a power hitting, big, tall, shortstop. Um, so they got him. 
Um, then they, they drafted uh, a third baseman slash shortstop out of a high school in Arizona with their second pick, Ivis Calf. And then third, they went with their third round before they got a college player, and they drafted Sean Burke, right-handed pitcher. Um, so, you know, they, they went with the, the high school route for their early on picks. Um, Colson Montgomery is a kid that, you know, has been linked to them and they did like the power. It's going to be a bit before he gets developed, but, um, a lot of promise Which is typical there. for high school right, kids. Right, right. Unless you're like Bryce Harper or something. Um, but, but switching to the Cubs, uh, they... They went with a more polished player. So they, they drafted with their first pick what most people are saying is the best left-handed pitcher in the draft, Jordan Wicks, who's a guy that they did not expect to be anywhere near their their slot when they picked. But he's a left-handed starting pitcher out of K-State. Um, so, you know, you add it to the list of Rowan Wick, Brad Wick, Jordan Wicks. And, uh, but... The guy, the guy throws a 95 mile an hour left-handed pitch with a terrific uh, curveball. I mean, a changeup. Changeup, yeah, changeup. Uh, so he looks. From what I'm reading, is they think he has a shot to be on the roster next year. Yeah, I mean, you know, we need to develop more starting pitching. It's really important for the Cubs to do that. And somebody in a report, I can't remember who it was, so forgive me, uh, I don't have the quote, but I heard somebody say he's kind of John Lester-like. And if that's the case, you will definitely take that. I know he, the, some of the stuff might be a little different. He throws, you know, 95 is a pretty good velocity. It's not spectacular, but it's pretty good. And, uh, you know, if a changeup is his bread, or bread and butter, it's a little different than John Lester. But mechanically is what I heard kind of has a similar John Lester type build. Yeah, so I, I'm, I think the Cubs are really excited about him. Uh, to have the best left-handed pitcher in the draft fall to, to the 20th pick um, is... It's huge. I've seen a lot of people thought that the the lowest he would go was the Cardinals at 18. And uh, they passed him by. So good on the Cubs there. Um, then uh, the second round pick, they, uh, uh, they drafted a, a kid who played mostly shortstop. But from what I'm reading is they drafted him as a third baseman is James Trianto, who was a high school kid. Um so they 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 feel they felt like they have a big pipeline of shortstop, so they want to uh, develop a third baseman. So that's that's where they're planning to play him. And then uh, another another uh, left-handed pitcher with a third-round pick is Drew Gray, who, um, from what I'm reading, is is very athletic, uh, power thrower. So. Um, he's out of high school. He went to the IMG Academy. So, um, you know, Cubs looking like they, they want to bring one guy along quick and then, you know, try to build that pipeline. Yeah, I think it's really good that they see prospects where they can make an impact coming soon, especially with Wicks. And that kind of reflects what Jed Hoyer said last week. Because it's really important to kind of look at the timeline here and kind of start to figure things out. Because 2021 is over. It's out the window. It's time for rebuild time. Now, what Jed Hoyer said last week, and I wrote about this for Cubby's Crib. That article is coming out soon on Fansided. Uh, looking at his quotes, he was on with Lawrence Holmes, the sixth send to the score. And he basically said that he plans to turn this around fairly fast. He feels that he already has some of the building blocks to build around, whereas he said in 2012, they didn't have those building blocks, so that obviously took a little longer, and he says there's no reason to take nearly as long as it did 
under the Epstein regime when they didn't really have much, where now he feels like the organization has the building blocks. So this could include their top prospects. This could include maybe a core piece. That answer, that question is going to be answered soon come the trade deadline, who stays, who goes. And now that you had another round of drafting and you anticipate your number one pick coming up fairly soon, I mean, I think that reflects right there that Jed Hoyer wants to get this turned around fairly quickly. He doesn't want several years of 90 to 100 losses. We're not going to go through that again. He feels that there's already the building blocks in place. Now you just kind of got to go around it. It's really more of a mass shakeup retool than a full out rebuild. It, it, because the full out rebuild is what we saw in 2012. It, what it is is the the Red Sox template that we've seen over the past decade. Yes. Is they'll stink for a year and then boom, they're back. They they shed some salary, they they shake things up, they bring up some minor league talent, infuse it with some free agents and that's kind of the the route they go and it's been successful. It's been very successful. And I think that's really what they're trying to do is um you know what? Hey, we're going to move on from some of these guys and we're going to replace them. You know, we got Brendan Davis who is obviously ready to to play at the next level. Um and you know, we're going to we're going to have you know, Jordan Wicks who we're going to give every opportunity to to be on the major league roster next year. Um, we've got a few other players that we think are, will be ready. Uh, we'll have, we'll have some more cash to play with and depending on who they move on from and what the, what they, they get is, as far as trades that could jumpstart everything. Yeah. And you mentioned Brennan Davis. He had a really nice showing in the Futures game yesterday. He had two home runs and won the MVP award. And Brennan Davis, you know, he got off to a slow start this year, but he has been absolutely raking recently. And you can attribute the slow start basically to the fact that you didn't have a minor league season last year. And honestly, I think that's kind of hurt a number of prospects in the minors. And now they're kind of starting to get a feel for things again. I mean, Brennan Davis right now, is the fancy prospect that's on the cusp of the majors. The other big fancy guy that's starting to catch people's eye is the young Christian Hernandez, but he's three, four years away. If you're looking more short-term, Brennan Davis is that five-tool guy that is getting more and more attention by the day. That's kind of your next quote-unquote stud prospect that's going to be coming up. You've brought up Nico Horner. He's shown a lot of promise. Uh, Braylon Marquez has unfortunately been hurt, but he's been one of your notable prospects for a while now. So Brendan Davis right now, he's really, I think, in my opinion, the one making the big impact in the minors right now where people are paying attention to and saying, yeah, him, uh, he's right around the corner. Miguel Amaya. Some of your other, Miguel Amaya is one that, you know, he seems like a great catcher, but the hitting, I look at his stats and the hitting isn't great. So I do worry a little there, but he, you know, he's an athletic kid who's really good behind the dish, but I, I, I just, I don't know if the hitting is there yet. I know he's still ranked as a top prospect in the organization, but I don't know. We'll see about that. I hope he works out. I hope he pans out, but the, the hitting stats have been pretty underwhelming the past few years, at least in my opinion. Um, Let's see, who else do we have that's, that's probably this year, or next year, ready to come up. Uh, uh, Christopher Morrell. Yeah, and he, you know he's got some pop, but again, the overall hitting stats, at least this year, aren't spectacular. Um, Ryan Jensen, probably next year. Mm-hmm. Chase Strumpf, probably next year. Mm-hmm. Um, Cole Rutterer. Probably next year. Um, Riley Thompson. Now we're starting to get down down the list a little bit. We're we're gonna see. Uh, did I don't know if Justin Steele came up already or if he's coming up. 
He did. Okay. Remember, he was a rel- he was a reliever for a bit, and he did really well, and then he got hurt. But now he's stretching out to be a starter, right? Which I like to see, and it sounds like his first start in the minors went really well. Yeah. So, you know, there's guys are starting to come up, and um, you know, and here's the thing, I, I asking you this question, and it was a question that I heard Boog Shambi ask. Are when the Cubs truly either win their next World Series or are in their next World Series, are the top two players on that that team on this roster on the in the forty man? The top two players. So the next time the Cubs play in a World Series, the two best uh-huh. players on that team. Are they in the Cubs system right now? I hope. Well, you know, maybe that changes at the trade deadline. I mean, I would. So what? Your top two players right now in the system are probably Brennan Davis and Braylon Marquez. Well, I mean, it could be a Chris Bryant, too. It's anywhere in the top you know okay so, uh, oh but, so you're but, saying but, within the entire organization it's, it's, at MLB level included well, ask yourself when when do you foresee the Cubs making a World Series next either winning or playing in a World Series maybe I don't know I think it's going to be at least three four years until they're at that level okay so I know Jed Hoyer wants to turn around fast but I just think it's going to take a little time to be legit World Series contenders so if they they make it to the World Series let's say four years from now the two best players on that on that team that takes them to the World Series, are they in our organization yet? Or are they going to be free agents or future draftees? And, and, and nobody knows. It's all it's a complete guess. I, yeah, I, I don't um, know. I, I I'd like to say yes. I really would like to say yes. But again, I'm curious to see what happens after the trade deadline because who knows if they trade Kimbrel, maybe they get some stud prospects that are close to the majors and they could end up being your future top guys because i don't see chris bryant coming back i really don't no i don't either um i i i think Baez could come back and if rizzo does come back i'm not sure for how long because you know again he he's declining and that back is more and more of an issue, and I see that bat speed slowing down. Look how many more strikeouts he's had lately. Right, and, you know, he he's at that point where he feels like, well, I gave a team-friendly deal. Now I want to cash in. And the Cubs are like, nah, we're going to pay you market value. And I think they're going to let him go to free agency and and see how that goes. Because I think it's going to be a wake up call, is who, who's going to pay a top dollar for Anthony Rizzo? And it's not a, it's not a knock. It's just where baseball is right now and where he is in his career. Yeah, I mean, look when you when you get older and you have injuries, what are you going to do about that, man? I mean, that's tough. It's it's not anything based on skill, but. I mean, it's got to be hard if you have a bad back to have quicker bat speed and swing for power, right? Especially with Rizzo's swing. We've seen him take some very violent hacks, and that, you know, that can affect your back. Right. Um, you know, so I honestly, if the Cubs are going to walk away from Rizzo and Bryant, I I don't want to re-sign Javi. Be honest with you. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it, his bat is going to age real bad. It's already kind of aging bad. He could still hit it out of the ballpark. He could still drive in runs, but man, does he whiff a lot. He he's a good player that's very flawed. Yeah, and if he played in the the eighties, in the early nineties, he would have. We would have looked at him a lot differently than today. Sure. And, you know, he does hit a whole lot of home runs. 
and he's a big draw. I mean, when when we went to the game, uh, I saw I probably saw more Baez jerseys than any other Cub, probably by a good margin. Very popular, but you you can't give that guy twenty five million dollars. And I mean, unless it's like a three year seventy five. You're like, all right, well, that sucks, but, um, you know, that's, you, you can't have that guy for a long-term deal. Yeah, I, I'm kind of torn on it because I do agree with you on a lot of those fronts. At the same time, I would hate to like let him go and then he goes somewhere else and he just keep plays out of his mind again like he did in 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, I feel like one person from this core has to stay. That's how I see it. And remember, we talk about Baez, Bryant, and By- uh, and Rizzo, but you got to remember that part of that core also contains Wilson Contreras. You can't forget about him. He's got one more year on his contract. And I get that, but you might, you know, what if you're tempted to say, you know what, if, you know, you're at the deadline and the fact that he's got another year of control ups his value and you might be able to swing something good because of that, maybe that changes your outlook on things. You know? I, I mean, yeah, that's that's a definite possibility. Um, okay, so the core four, you had to pick one to stick around. Who would it be, regardless of of price, of years, just based on pure talent and what they bring? Who would it be? For me, it's easy. For me, it's for Chris me Bryant. at this point, it's Chris Bryant. Yes. If you would have asked me a few years ago, I would have said Anthony Rizzo. I would have said Anthony Rizzo, hands down, no question. But Bryant, we've seen when he's healthy, can still play at an all-star slash MVP level. We were worried about that a few years ago when Brian kept getting injured. And Anthony Rizzo a few years ago was still in his prime and was still a well-rounded baseball player that was very well balanced. Now we're seeing Anthony Rizzo slowing down and we're seeing those back problems getting worse. So right now, to me, it's obviously Chris Bryan. Yeah, obviously, I mean, so of the four, I rank them like this. Um, it's tough to just rank them regardless of, of, I can do it regardless of price, but I can't re- do it regardless of years. So let's say five year contract. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to go, if you have to sign them to a five year deal, I'm saying, I go Bryant, Contreras, Baez, Rizzo. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. And again, if you would have told me this two years ago even, and you heard Rizzo dead last, I would have said, what are you nuts? But again, circumstances have changed here. Um I would definitely put Brian first and I'd probably put Contreras second. Cause remember with Contreras, he is versatile. Remember in 2016 when he played the outfield and he can play first base and you can almost say, you know what? If you don't want him to be a catcher forever, you can move him around. I mean, here's the thing about Anthony Rizzo. He is only a first baseman, only a first baseman. Chris Bryant has played virtually everywhere this year. Baez can play short or second base. Heck, even if you maybe even want to play him at first, he could probably play there. Or third. Or third. And Wilson Contreras, you know, you could play him at first. You could play him in the outfield. You play him a catcher. Anthony Rizzo, unless he's pitching in a blowout game as a joke, he's only a first baseman or a DH. For what it's worth, Wilson Contreras and the minors did play second and third as well. I'm not saying you do that in the majors, but you can definitely move that guy to first or corner outfield spot. Sure. Absolutely. He might be a nice corner outfield spot because 
He is athletic and he's got a yes, power powerful arm. Mhm. Um you know that honestly th- that might make him more worthwhile to to keep around because all right, when you bring up a Miguel Amaya that he's not necessarily blocking him, you can move Wilson Contreras who's got a much better bat to a corner outfield spot or first base where you're going to preserve him for longer. Right. He's probably not going to be happy about it, but um yeah, it's a it's it's probably a good move for your team. Absolutely. Now, another thing that I think is a big factor in all this, and I might have said this on this show again, but I'll say it again regardless. Things I think would be different with Anthony Rizzo with Anthony Rizzo had the NL implemented the DH permanently. Because I feel like it's easier to justify keeping a guy like Rizzo around longer if he can DH. If he's not in the field putting the stress on his back every day and you can DH him, I think that changes things a lot with him. I don't know what your feelings are, but that's the way I feel. Yeah, it does. It changes a lot of things. Um, But I, from what I'm reading is it probably is not coming back anytime soon. So yeah, exactly. You know, you look at him as, yeah, he's got to play first base and he's still a good first baseman, but he's not, his back is going to get worse from playing first base. Right. Exactly. So I, I mean, you know, Here's the thing is Jed basically said that they're, they're going to be sellers and you know, you've got a lot of things to do and I, I'm fine shaking things up now and you got a half a season to figure some things out. Sure. You're going to suck. You're going to lose a lot of baseball games, but you know what is part ways with guys, bring some guys up. Give them a little experience better than spring training. Do you actually get real experience? Um, and you, you sort of get a better understanding of where your, your gaps are, where you need to spend the money, where you need to shore up your, your farm system. Um, you know, so Chafin's got trade value. Kimbrell's got a lot of trade value. Bryant's got trade value. Contreras is a lot of trade value. Um, it, it just move, move everybody. I'm move everybody that's not, not going to be part of this team next year. Yeah, and you know, there is also that dream out there where you say, why don't you trade some of these guys, and if you really want to keep them in the future, re-sign them. But I don't think that's going to work with Chris Bryant, just considering who his agent is and honestly, you know, how his... Honestly, I think it is the easiest to sign Chris Bryant afterwards. You think? Because it's 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 blind. And with is, as far as uh, Scott Boris goes... He it's he's colorblind to the team. It's who who's going to pay him the most money. And if the Cubs are like, you know what, we want him back. We got a haul for him. He helped the team, you know, go deep in the postseason. Now we're going to go. Here's opening the checkbook, and he comes right back. That that's that's kind of it. It's fair. He Chris Bryant. Chris Bryant signed with Scott Boris for a reason, and it's to get paid. It's not why I'm mad at the Cubs because of the service time manipulation. It's, you know what? I want to get paid. And if the Cubs are like, well, we'll pay you. Then he goes, I always wanted to be a Cub again. That's fair. I mean, that that is a good point. I, I can't help but wonder if the Rizzo camp is a little strained in their relationships with the Cubs after last off season. I would imagine so. And I would say, if of the four core, if if you were to trade Anthony Rizzo, which I don't see happening, I don't know who's giving up anything for him. Um, but if you were to trade him and then try to bring him back, no, nah, he'd have hard feelings, and you wouldn't be able to do that. Chris Bryant is in is he hired a mercenary, and if they were like, all right, 
our best offer is $30 million a year for eight years. And you're like, all right, we'll give you eight years, 32 million. Well, he's a cub. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't necessarily disagree with that. I'm just not sure the Ricketts are going to shell out enough money. That is another story, though. Is right, right. Is, because that would be if they didn't trade him and they said, you know, we want to keep you because we want you here long term. Uh, what they do by trade deadline does not matter to the future of whether Chris Bryan plays for you next year or not. Because it's going to be, it's whoever pays him the most in the offseason is who he's going to play for next year. Right. And so, um, you know, some other guys, I think, I think Wilson Contreras probably, I mean, he's got two years left, but if you were to try to re-sign him, I don't think so. He's, he's a hot-headed guy. Javi Baez, a, you know, emotional guy. Anthony Rizzo, I think is, I think it is a little bit of a strained relationship. And I understand both sides in the Anthony Rizzo situation, because look, is he's like, well, I, I gave a hometown discount so we could afford to get these other guys and win the World Series. Now I want to be paid. And they're going to be like, why Why are we going to pay 30, the guys on the wrong side of 30 with a back injury that can only play first base? And that's numbers have dropped pretty well. Like this does not bode well for us in the long term. So why would we bring you back? And, they're, you know, I don't think they're saying no. I think what they're saying is, you know what? Why don't you test the market? And then come back to us, and then we'll discuss. Because I think he, I think Anthony Rizzo, is, is I understand his sentiment, but his sentiment is based on emotion, and this is a business. He needs to go out there and get the wake up call of what his market value is, and, and then come back to the Cubs with his tail tucked a little bit. Well, here's the thing too. He's had the opportunity to prove that he's worth the money he wants. And he's putting up not bad numbers, but they're not spectacular. I mean, right now he's batting 247, a 342 on base, pretty good. 429 slugging, not bad. 771 OPS, it's above average, not spectacular. It's above average. 10 home runs, 33 ribbies. Is that worth something? Yes. Is it worth hundred million plus dollars with his with his age and his back? Nope. No. And the year before that, batted two twenty two, three forty two, four fourteen, seven fifty five. Again, the slugging and the OPS and the OBP was above average, but it was just above average. It wasn't spectacular. If he was putting up like twenty nineteen numbers where he hit two. 293, 405, slugged over 500, had an OPS above 900, then yeah, he is worth that money. But he hasn't done that in two years. And here's the thing. And he's only getting older and his back is getting worse. Are his numbers bad? No, but l compare them to his career averages. So batting average, he's batting 247. He's a, like a 270 career hitter. So he's, mm -hmm. he's like... Uh, you know, he's, he's a good 20 some points lower than his, his career batting average, um, on base percentage, he's 30 points lower his slugging. He's, um, 50 points down, you know, so that brings on his, op, uh, OPS. He's at 80 points lower than his, his career OPS. Um, you know, his, his uh, walks are down, his strikeouts are up, and not significantly, but those things start to creep up. Mm -hmm. is, is his strikeout percentage in 2018 was 12%, then 14%, then 15.6, then 16.6. His walk rate went from 0.88 to 0.83 to 0.74 to 0.58. So he's walking less. Um, and I'm sure if you go look at the war, the war is going to be the same. You're going to see a dip every year. And that's, 
That's not what what you need to see in in a player that you, a free agent that you're trying to bring back. Yeah, here we go. Um, so since 2014, here's his war. Five, uh, five, three, five, two, four, nine, four, one, two, nine, four, one point one, and then this year zero point seven. It's a big, yeah, that's a big drop. It is a big drop. It's very significant. So I, I just I don't know how. How you. You justify giving that guy big money. And I think the Cubs are, are doing it the right way. They're like, you know what? Here, listen, we want to bring you back, but um, is go out there, see what the market value is for you, and and then come back and we'll talk. And I think that's fair. It's not saying, nope, get the hell out of here, but it's also going, you know, hey, if somebody's willing to pay you the $25 million a year, then go take it. It's more, it's, it's, it's a business operation is what it is. I mean, let's just be real. Um, let's see. Jock Peterson, if you can flip him, flip him. Otherwise you got an option for him next year. And I don't know how you bring him back. Um, I think, I think they'll flip him. Even if it's just for pennies, I think they'll flip him. Yeah. I mean, you flip him for a low level prospect and you, you it's a lottery ticket. You know right. who he is, and he doesn't fit in your long-term plans. But if you bring in a guy that are like, all right, well, listen, we can, maybe we can, you know, this guy has some upside. We'll see how that goes. Um, Arietta, zero percent. They gone, got a club gone, option for him next year. Zero percent. He back. He's gone. back next year. Um, you might as well just buy, pay him that two million dollar buyout. Uh fee right now because he's not back and honestly what are the odds that he plays on a major league roster next year i think next year he'll be invited to spring training as either a camp invitee or he'll sign a minor league deal somewhere do you think he his pride lets him do that if it's the only way to get him a job yes he's got enough money though I just he's not going to quit the game though. He's not going to stop playing. Yeah, but is he going to play in the minors or is he going to take the the invite and then take free agency if he doesn't get into the camp or into a, on a team? I don't see him uh, I don't see him riding a bus. I don't know. I I don't know. He he's got an ego. I don't know if he's that egotistical, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I know, I know he, th- he thinks he's still good, and he's clearly not, so <laughs> we'll see, I guess. I mean, the guy's earned $100 million in his career. It's a lot of money. Yeah. So I, I just look at it as, you know, is he, gonna, is he actually going to play in the minors just because he loves playing the game? And I'm not saying it's egotistical. Is you, When you're in the minors, you're riding on a bus. You're yeah. staying in, in cheaper hotels. You're not eating at nice restaurants. You're playing in off cities. You're not playing in New York and uh, Los Angeles and Anaheim and San Francisco and Chicago. You're playing in, you know, Albuquerque and Saskatoon and all kinds of, you know, oddball places. Like that's, you're living in Iowa if you, or wherever. That's... um. That's that's the reality. So is that what he wants to do with $100 million? I think he's going to do everything he can to get back to the majors before he just can't. That's just my oh, opinion. I, I think so too. But I, I think if it's going to be a – when he signs with a, a, you know, a minor league contract with a camp invite, it's going to be with the – the, the caveat of if I don't get on the major league roster, I'm going to elect, I'm going to take free agency and try somewhere else. I think that's, I think that's the key is, you know, he wants to play major league baseball. He does not want to play minor league baseball and I don't blame him. No, he, I mean, he, he definitely wouldn't want to spend a, a year in the minors. That's for sure. So 
you know, he might he might be one of those guys that gets a, probably catches on with somebody, doesn't make their major league roster, jumps to another team, maybe maybe sticks around there for part of it. You know, I, I just I just don't know how much he's got left in that tank. I don't think he's got anything, frankly. I hate to say it, but yeah. Oh man, Shoy is really hitting him now. Um. So yeah, I guess that's. You know, now we're getting close to the deadline. Now we know definitely the Cubs are going to be sellers. Is how to what degree do you think they sell? What degree? Like, are they going to sell everything that's not nailed down? Or do you think that they are they're going to only sell if they get a deal that makes sense? Yeah, I, I don't see them selling just the sell. I think they're going to um they're gonna try to get the best deals they can. I don't think they're gonna unload everything. You know, I, I think they're gonna make sure the deals make sense and they might keep a veteran or two around that they'd hope to trade but didn't trade. Um, you know, I can tell you right now, Jason Hayward's probably not going anywhere. I don't think Ian Happ is going anywhere unless he goes to Iowa. That's the only place I'd see him going. Um, I think Jack Peterson is gone. I think Jake Marisnik is probably gone. I think that, um, I mean, Craig Kimbrell is pretty much a guaranteed gone at this point. Um, really, it's a matter of who they trade on the core that I think is the big mystery because you can point to pretty much everybody else and say, yeah, they're probably gone um, if they're just a veteran supporting piece. Um, in terms of the rotation, Zach Davies might be flipped for a coupon, um, and that's really about it. I don't know how much of their starting rotation that they're going to get rid of just because they don't have replacements. So they just need somebody to go out there and pitch. So I, I don't know if I see we I see anybody from the the unless it's they trade in the package, they get another throw in starter, you know, like a downgrade. Right. That's the right. only way I could see that. Because they just don't have the uh, more arms. Um and uh so I I think you're right, Marisnik gone, Peterson gone. Um, Kimber gone, Chafin gone, and of the core, I think I think you could be you could see any of them gone, depending on what the package is and what the demand is. Because if sure. if if they get a good haul for Chris Bryant, they will move Chris Bryant. Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. If if somebody's willing to pony up for Wilson Contreras, I think they will move on from Wilson Contreras. They'd have to really pony up for him, though. Yeah, yeah. I don't, they're not going to sell short on him. No, because they don't need to. You could, of those guys, I think, you know, you, you could keep him. So, I, it, it's going to depend on what the market looks like. And I, I really hope that Craig Kimbrell can bring them a haul. Yeah, I mean, who was it? John Morosi or somebody was saying that he's one of the more valuable assets at the trade deadline. Of course. Around the whole league. Because you, you which makes sense. You look around and like, okay, Chris Bryant's, an, uh, you know, another, you know, you look at it and you're like, okay, Anthony Rizzo, like, who needs who needs a power hitting third first baseman? The your the number of teams really that's willing to be a buyer at the deadline. It's a uh, you know, you're really, you're really uh, shrinking the market. You expand the market a lot with Chris Bryant because he's a better power hitter and he can play the corner outfield spots. He could play first base. He could play third base. Um, you know, it gives you, gives you more versatility. So you're like, okay, if we are, if we are a contending team, and you need any of those positions, you're like, all right, well, we could move th some things around and, and bring in a Chris Bryant. But, you know, even though Craig Kimbrell is, he's a closer, that's what he is. Name one team that can't use a shutdown closer. 
The thing is, even if you have a shutdown closer, exist. yeah. If you even if you have a shutdown closer, you could use another one. Yeah, why not? It's the post it, postseason these days. You rely on relievers more than ever. Is if you have if you I mean it, I, you almost like man if if we have a shutdown closer, wouldn't it be nice to have a second one? You you basically make it a seven run game or seven inning game. It's you lock down the eighth, you lock down the ninth, or hell, you use one of them. Uh, you know what if what if your starter gets stuck in the sixth and you need somebody to come in there and get you out of a jam? Boom. You know, he comes in in the sixth, and you still got a, your other closer to come close the game out. It's, it is, yeah, exactly. It is a, you know, a, amazing tool. So basically, the market for him is any team that's a buyer at the deadline. Exactly. Exactly. You can name any contending team. You can look at Boston. You can look at the Astros. You can look at. The Dodgers, the Padres, the White Sox even, dare I say. Um, you could look at any of those teams and say, yeah, we could use a Craig Kimbrell. Yeah, I, I just, he's, he is good as gone and it's just going to be who's the highest bidder. And I think you will see bids for him. You know, we talked before, all right, well, we aren't going to see a Glaber Torres type trade. Now I'm starting to think is maybe, maybe you could. Because I'm crossing my fingers. I'm crossing my fingers. Um, but you know the, it just takes one team. And you know I think I think you're more likely to get a big haul for him than you are for pretty much anybody else. I mean Chris Bryant. I th I think. I think people are going to be tentative about about uh, trading for him, um, but I don't know. I just it's a uh, Craig Craig Kimbrell is is a guy that people are just going to bid on. It's a no brainer. Yeah, it, it makes it makes sense for anybody. Uh. So we got what two more weeks till the deadline? Yeah, yeah. And the rumors are going to start coming fast and furious. And I, I, yeah, and it's it's going to be ugly on the field. I think we had the whole Wilson Contreras thing the other day, kind of calling out everybody. And I, I think a lot of guys are kind of just you know they know the rumors are coming. They know that many of them are likely on the move. I just don't think you're going to see some good focus baseball as we go forward. That's just my opinion. I mean, here's my thing about the Wilson Contreras. Is what he said wrong? No. No, no, but it's not. he's part of the problem. Like, you know, he's he's not playing, like, superstar baseball. He's been very streaky this year. Yeah, I mean, here's here's his numbers on the season. 236, 344, 419 slugging. Um, like that's that's not terrible, but that's that's not uh it's not all star level and he's been all star level the past few seasons, if you don't count last year. Yeah, so um I I I don't he just doesn't have the leg leg to stand on. Um you know, his his BABIP is the lowest it's been in his career. His walks are way up, um, but his strikeouts are way up too. So, like you know, he's he's what he's saying is right. It's just a little hypocritical to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, like you said, he's not wrong. No, that's always the thing is, is something needs to be said and you're like, all right, well, someone's got to say, somebody's got to say David it. David Ross isn't going to say it. Then someone's got to say it. Right. Um, but I, I one last thing I want to do is let, let's go through MLB and who, who's going to be in the buyer pool? Uh, Boston, obviously Boston, Tampa, Tampa. Bay. 
is Toronto is Toronto a buyer? Uh, let me look at the standings. Where exactly is Toronto? They would be tied for second in the wild card. I think they might try to go for it. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Um, Yankees are Yankees are tied there too, but I don't. They are sputtering. Yeah, but I don't. Here's think the that thing. I just. Yeah, I don't think they should be buyers necessarily, but. Will the Yankees yield? I, I'm not so sure. I, I think the Yankees just sort of stand pat. Yeah, I could see it. I um, could see it. Orioles, nothing. They're they're sellers. Yeah. Uh, the they're White Sox, like the White Sox below. should be buyers. Yes. I think everybody else in their division is not going to no, – no, no buyers in their division other than White Sox. Yeah, no, no other buyers, none. Um, Houston will be buyers. Mm-hmm. Oakland will stand. Oakland, pat. they they should be buyers. I just don't know if they they will, but I'll put them in the buyer camp. Um, I think Seattle probably stands pat. I don't want. I don't think they're a team that's playing better than anybody expected, and they're a team built. For but the they're future. not going to buy. They're not buyers. They're not. They're not sellers. They're still they're, building up. Yeah. So, uh, Angels in Texas. They're nope. Nope. Mets will be buyers. I think Atlanta, any hope that they had of being buyers was dashed when Acuna went down. Yeah. Which is brutal. Um, Washington, not going to be a buyer. Miami, not going to be a buyer. Philadelphia, probably not going to be buyers. So just the Mets. Milwaukee buyers. They've already been buyers. Yeah. Um, and then I think that's. Do you think Cincinnati's a buyer? I think I think they should. They should go for it. Um, I, I I could see them making a move. All right. Nobody else in the division is a buyer. No. Cubs will be selling. And then Pirates will be selling. And then in the West, Cardinals will be selling. Yeah. In the West, the Dodgers, the the Giants, and the Padres will all be buyers. Yep. And then Rockies and Arizona. Nope. So you're looking at three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve buyers. It's uh not a crazy high number, but it's enough to it's enough to have bidding wars. Oh yeah, there'll be markets open. Um, but the last thing I want to do is Talk a little tiny bit of bears. We said that we wanted to pre-camp, um, you know, just give our early, early uh, 53 man roster guesses here. Uh, but before that is before we record our next show will be the deadline when players that were given the franchise tag will have to sign a long-term contract. So that will be this Thursday at three o'clock Chicago time. Does Allen Robinson sign an extension with the Chicago Bears? Uh, if you would have asked me before they drafted Justin Fields, I think that'd be an easy no. Now I think there's an open for the possibility, but I'm still not quite sure he's going to. You know, if... He could be playing this year as a way to saying, hey, I'm going to play for that big contract next year. I would, if you were, if, if there was no, if this was like the eighties where you didn't get a lot of rumors and there was no internet and I would be like, and after the Justin, like you said, pre Justin Fields, no post Justin Fields, I would have said, I think it's possible, but now we get a lot of rumors and we, we hear a lot of things and I'm hearing just like before the end of the season, no movement. Nothing. So, yeah. Nothing. So. I I do not think it gets done. I think he plays on that tag and and watch the Bears will franchise tag him next year too. <laughs> um yeah, I I'm leaning towards no still. Uh Eddie Goldman, we did not see him at the mandatory mini camp, but but he's back in Chicago. He's been seen at working out at 
local places, not at Hallis Hall, but around around town. He's been working out. So he is in Chicago. It's a good sign. I wonder what's going on there. I wonder if there's just something big that we don't know about. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I mean, he, he he's at least in town. That's just a good sign. Um, it's something. We've had multiple sightings of Justin Fields working out with Jordan Love and Deshaun Watson, which is good. I think it's a good thing. You're seeing him take take full advantage of of getting those workouts in. He's not off doing dumb stuff like who was who was the uh, Chiefs player they got arrested with an Uzi. Um, you know, oh yeah! Like, Who was that? I remember that though. Like, what is he in an '80s karate movie? Um, but <laughs> he's a he's a Rambo. <laughs> uh, is but you know he's out there working out with with a top notch quarterback in in Justin Fields. It was Frank Clark, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, with uh Deshaun Watson, you're seeing him work out, so that's. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, you, you like seeing it, you know, he's, he's already gearing up for, for playing in major league base or major baseball. I'm looking at major league baseball sign saying what I'm reading. Um, wow. Actually, part of the Cubs rebuild is going to be around Justin Fields. I, cool. I'm okay with that. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. It's better than some of the players they have. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I like seeing him pre pre bears camp already working out with NFL caliber quarterbacks and honing his skills already. I like that. I think that's good. It shows it's, it's something we didn't see with, with Mitchell Trubisky. Um, no, no, we didn't see that. No. Um, we, we do have another story of a, bear, a player that played on the bears last year. Barkevius Mingo. Oh, Barkevius Mingo. Ew. And you yeah. know what? I I was on the man. I hope they resign him camp because I thought he did some nice things on the field, but man, what he's doing behind closed doors is brutal. I I don't want to talk about. Yeah, about that. I I don't know if did you read the specifics of what he did. No, I didn't read the specifics. I just saw the main headline. Yeah. It it was a it was a a rapid grooming of a young boy, and um, and then taking sexual advantage of him. It was it was a gross story, and um, he he has been arrested, and you know he's been cut by the the Atlanta Falcons, and I don't I don't ever see him playing in the NFL ever again. Oh God, yeah, I'm. Ew, wow, yuck, 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 yuck. That's bad. Uh, but let's do a rapid fire here, and so I'm. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read the players, and then that are on the roster for the Bears, and then I'm gonna tell you for that position set because some of them of what they had last year. So like. Offensive linemen, they didn't be like, oh, this many centers, this many tackles. It was, they had nine offensive linemen. So I'm going to read them in that okay. group. Uh, so the, f the first group I have here is is quarterback. So currently on the roster, you have Nick Foles, Justin Fields, Andy Dalton. And last year, you only kept two quarterbacks on the 53-man roster. What happens this year? Well, if you can't get rid of Nick Foles, you're going to have to have all three, right? I mean, what choice do you have? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, unless you get a ma massive injury right off the bat in training camp, I, I don't see how, how Nick Foles is on your team or isn't on your team this year. So he won't dress. Right. He won't dress for those games, but he'll be on the 53. So I, I have yep. three this year. Um, wide receiver last year, the bears kept for the, uh, the, you know, the first game roster, they had seven wide receivers. So this year you've got 
Javon Wims, Jester Wee, Allen Robinson, Riley Ridley, Daz Newsom, Darnell Mooney, Anthony Miller, Khalil McClain, Chris Lacey, Thomas Ives, Marquise Goodwin, Demir Bird, and Rodney Adams. So how many of those guys do you see as making the roster this year? Well, Robinson, yes. yes. Darnell Mooney, yes. Yes. Wasn't Daz Newsome the guy that got hurt? Yes, but he's he broke his collarbone. It was a clean one. He's going to be ready for training camp. Okay. Um, Anthony Miller is probably going to make your team. Um, I don't know if I'm imagining this or this was real, that they wanted to utilize Riley Ridley a little more in this coming year. I could see, I, I see Riley Ridley making the roster. Um, why Javon Wims is still on the roster, I don't know. Um, ser- serious question, why is he still there? Um, but let's see. So that's one, two. So three, I'm looking at it four. is all right, Allen Robinson, Locke. Darnell Mooney, yep. Locke. I'm going to yep. say... Daz Newsome, probably a lock because you drafted him fairly high. Unless he's injured, yeah, I think so. He's you're gonna make it. So that's three. Um, if he's healthy, he's there. Yeah, I'm and I'm gonna assume health on all these guys. Just as yeah. a you know, Anthony Miller four. I'm gonna go Marquise Goodwin and Demir Bird four and five. Because you so you don't think Anthony you Miller's brought those up. guys in um, as veteran guys so that's i would say you're probably going to do last year seven so you have riley ridley and anthony miller as your six seven and then javon wims gone um thomas i I, I just i don't see i don't see them keeping javon wims all right so tight end last year they kept Five. We currently have Cole Komet, Jesper Horstead, JP Holtz, Scooter Harrington, Jimmy Graham, and Jake Butt. Well, Jimmy Graham is probably going to be your number one as long as he's on the team, right? Probably. I'm going to say Cole Komet probably your one. I mean, they did play slightly different positions, uh, but I think Cole Komet is going to be integrated into your into your game plan more because he's younger. Oh, I agree with that. Jimmy Graham is going agree. to be utilized in certain situations. Red zone but, situations. But Cole Komet, Jimmy Graham are locks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I Jake, Jake, Butt, I think makes this team. And then whew, it's kind of between Holtz and Horstead, you think? I don't know. They seemed pretty high on Scooter Harrington, who's the biggest of them. Um, he, I mean, he's he's he is six, younger. He's, I mean, yeah, he's he's a rookie. He'd be six five, two fifty. Um, I don't. They probably practice squad Scooter, and I'm gonna say they. JP Holtz. I think they keep four because they take they rob from the tight end pool to to pay the quarterback pool. Right. Um let's see. Uh running back. Last year they kept three. I think they do the same thing, three. I I think it's gonna be Dave Montgomery, Tariq Cohen, and then Damian Williams. I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's not. I, I, I think don't it's see four. Ryan Null necessarily. I think they keep four. Um, you think they keep four, really? Well, I, Tariq Cohen might start the season on the pup list, which, you know, gives them a little bit of wiggle room. But true. So last year they kept three. You added Damian Williams, who I think makes this roster. David Montgomery definitely I makes so this too. roster. You've got Artavis yeah. Pierce, who got some playing time last year, but you drafted Khalil Herbert, who I think probably makes this roster. Tariq Cohen. So I think four. 
I think four, and you probably practice squad a couple guys. Ryan Nall gets sent packing. You're never going to see a meaningful snap by yeah, for the no. Chicago Bears. By no, Ryan you'll Nall. see him in preseason. That's about it. <laughs> um, kicker. So okay, let me ask you this really quick, th- quick though on running backs. If you had to choose between Damian Williams or their draft pick Khalil Herbert, which one would you choose? Let's say they had to go with three. And Montgomery was your one, and a healthy Tariq Cohen was your two. Who's your three? I I probably – man, that's tough. I mean, Damian Williams is the veteran. And he's the veteran, and if you, this is so a team – So you know what you're getting in him. And this is the team that you're – the the coaches are saying that they're going for it this year, that they expect big things on offense. And if that's the case, um, you probably, I mean, Damian Williams doesn't need to carry the load. I would probably say Damian Williams just because he's got the veteran experience. Right. Um, and right. then try to practice squad Khalil Herbert. Um, but I mean, yeah. So I would go Montgomery Cohen Williams again, assuming all health. It's kind of what I was thinking. Um, kicker, punter, long snapper. I think those are all locks. No need to really go through those. Um, what? There's going to be no punt competition this year? <laughs> there should have been, I think. Uh, especially since they were so tight on on financial cap spaces. Why why pay a guy one point some one point seven million when you could have paid a guy seven hundred fifty? Save yourself a million dollars. I'll punt. I can't punt very far, but I'm cheap. <laughs> um, here we go. Defensive line. They kept five guys last year. And here's here's your um pool. Robert oh sorry, he's in, they haven't been outside line, but, uh Lakale London, Sam Kamara, Akeem Hicks, Mario Edwards, Angelo Blackson, uh Kiris Tonga, Mike Pinnell, Bilal Nichols, Daniel Archibong. Um, mm, 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 mm. Oh, I got to go down because they're. And Eddie Goldman. Well, Eddie Goldman's kind of a mystery right now, isn't he? But I, I don't think there's any way he doesn't, unless he decides to retire. There's no way he's. He's not on. I pray he is. They they need him. So they kept five. I think Mario Edwards, Akeem Hicks, mm-hmm. Eddie Goldman, Bilal Nichols, mm-hmm. and... Probably. Can we just sue Daniel Archibong because I love that name? <laughs> Probably Kira's Tonga because they he was a draft pick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, from BYU. From Brigham Young, like Jimmy Mack. Um, all right. We got linebacker. Last year they kept – this is inside and outside linebacker. Okay. So last year they kept nine. You've got Robert Quinn, Danny Trevathan, Roquan Smith, Josh Woods, James Vauders, Charles Snowden, Michael Pinckney, Ladarius Mack, Caleb Johnson, Joel Ibinaway, Travis Gibson, Jeremiah Adichu. Um, and then where do they have... Khalil Mack and Khalil Mack, Christian Jones, Austin Calitro. So I th- okay. So uh, we got to state the obvious: Danny Trevathan, yes; Roquan Smith, Robert Quinn, Khalil Mack. That's four. Obviously, they're in. So you're looking um, probably five. So Christian Jones. Christian Jones. Yep. Um. And Jer- Travis Gibson. So we got five left. So we got gave one to Christian Jones. Probably. Oh, I'm going to go 
Josh Woods as the other the other inside. Okay. And then you're probably looking three more outside. So Travis Gibson, Jeremiah, I think he makes Itachu, it. And then Charles Snowden, the, the rookie. I could see it. Yeah, I think. And then James Waters, Ladarius Mack, Joel E. would you know, being away, they all go bye bye. Um, you can be away. I could, you could see him being a practice squad. I guy could see, I could see him winning that fourth, fourth inside linebacker spot. Um, yeah, I mean, because we've seen him before. Yeah, I, it's, it's going to be that's that's where those competition is. You know, those last couple spots there. Right, that's where preseason's actually going to have some significance. Um, they kept. 10 defensive backs last year. So that's corners and safeties. Um, so we've got Kendall Vildor, Desmond Trufant, Tease Tabor, Duke Shelley, Michael Joseph. More like D's Nuts Tabor. <laughs> I'm sorry. Got him. <laughs> I will never not laugh at that. It's like, D's Nuts. Ha! Got him. I will never stop laughing at that. Shout out to listener and good friend Andrew Keller, who loves that very much. And let's not forget the time when an election <laughs> write-in was these nuts. I remember when I first moved to Philadelphia, there was like a, a strip mall of stores and they were, it was, they were tearing the whole building down. And there was the old sign that was hanging up in front of the store while it was like, had the fence around it when they were tearing it down. And it was, the store was called Dietz Hats. And somebody, some tagger went over and sprayed over hats, nuts. So it said Dietz Nuts. Ah, yes. <laughs> and I was like, got him. <laughs> got him. All right. So Desmond Trufant, Tease Nuts Tabor, Duke Shelley, Michael Joseph, Jalon Johnson, Thomas Graham Jr., Artie Burns, Deontay Ruffin, Trey Roberson, DeAndre Houston Carson, Rogesterman Ferris, Xavier Crawford, Marquis Christian, Dion Bush, and... Uh, 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 Did you say Artie Burns already? Yes, Artie Burns, and then I gotta go all the way down, because this is alphabetical by position. Uh, Jordan Lucas... And uh, Eddie Jackson to Sean Gibson. Okay, so Eddie Jackson. Yes. Jalen Johnson. Yes. DeAndre Houston Carson. Yes. To Sean Gibson. Yes. Sean Gibson. So that's four. Duke Shelley. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe. I'm saying Kendall Vildor. Yes. He seems to be the one that sh he was... Uh, this is going to be a second year, and he was mm -hmm. really beyond spotty last year, but apparently mm -hmm. looking good in minicamp. So I think well, I think that he's he got could to, translate. So I I think he him Desmond Trufant. Yep. Did we say Dion Bush already? You said uh, no. We didn't say Dion Bush. Well, but we could say Dion Bush. Uh, uh, uh. I think he's a pretty safe bet. Yeah, probably. What you think? Probably. Um, Thomas Graham, the 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 rookie. So now yep. we're at one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. We're at eight. So probably two more corners. Artie Burns. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go probably Artie Burns, Duke Shelley. Yeah, yeah, because we saw a little bit of both of them. Yeah, um, so I think that's going to be a tight, tight race there. But mm -hmm. um, as far as the defensive backs go, um, so that big years. Uh, let's look for big years from Jalen Johnson, Eddie Jackson. That's all I'm going to say. I hope so. I sure hope so. 
because you want Eddie Jackson to get back to his 2017-2018 form, and I, I think there's a reason to believe right now that Chuck Pagano's system just wasn't best for him. And also, Jalen Johnson, I think the dude's got all the talent in the world. He's just got to stay healthy. Easier said than done. Yeah, much easier said than done. All right, so the last position group is offensive linemen, and last year they kept nine. So, so you're Cody Whitehair. Whitey Coat Hair. Well, let's list the, list the guys first. All right, so Whitey Coat Hair. Whitey Coat Hair. <laughs> Adam Redmond. Come on. You having trouble? I got the list right here if you need me to read it. Yeah, no, I just, uh, on the Bears website, I sorted it by position, but then they don't list them all. Like, they'll be like, oh, safety, free safety, DB, and so they've got to mix up. All right, so Lechavius Simmons. Dorian Parker, Arlington Hambright, Dieter Eiselin, James Daniel, Gage Cervenka, Larry Barome, Tyrone Wheatley Jr., Sam Mustafer, Elijah Wilkinson, Badera Treor, Tevin Jenkins, Jermaine Fetty, Alex Bars. Um, and that's it. Okay, so Whitey Coat Hair. Yes. Sam Mustafer. Tevin, Jen- Tevin Jenkins. Yes. James Daniel. Jermaine Fetty. Jermaine James Daniel. Okay, so those are your five that are probably your likely starters. So we got to find four more, four more guys of that list. Um, Alex Bars, I think. I'm say Elijah Wilkinson, probably. Um, okay, let me just say, if Arlington Hambright does make the team somehow, then that just confirms they're moving to Arlington Heights. <laughs> it's going to be their subtle way of confirming that. Um, I'm going to say Alex Bars, Elijah Wilkinson, Larry Barome are three. So we've got one more guy to fill. And uh, um, let's see. There are some guys on here I honestly don't know much about. I don't really see Arlington Hambright in all seriousness. I know he was a very late pick, not this past draft, but the one before. Because I made Arlington Heights jokes before I even knew that Arlington Heights could be the future home of the Chicago Bears. Um, All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn, Google Play, Spotify, etc. Share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Um, follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Uh, Alex Pat Sports Chat dot dot com or on Facebook Alex Pat Sports Chat. Follow Alex and uh, some of his great writings. And thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win. We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Ah! Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go bearing down...